So, in this first uh, lecture on DEA, I illustrated the application of DEA in the example of electricity distribution firms. So, the purpose of this uh, second uh, lecture is uh, to look in more detail to the inside the black box of DEA to see how DEA is actually calculating those um, efficiency scores and where do those uh, intensity weights and multiplier weights actually come from. So, to go into DEA, uh, let us go back to the foundational article by Charles Cooper and Rhodes uh, in 1978, which uh, coined the term uh, DEA and introduced the, the uh, linear programming formulations that we are using today. So, uh, as a background, I think it's also interesting to, to note that uh, the motivation for Charles Cooper and Rhodes came from an, a real-world application uh, to juvenile delinquency programs or program follow-throughs. So, for the, for the purposes uh, of, uh, of uh, our understanding, we can think about the, the units under evaluation as, as schools. And it's interesting to note that uh, the inputs and outputs are not really in the original DEA application, uh, the usual type of labor and capital and, uh, and economic outputs, but uh, rather they are this kind of school metrics like, like uh, certain types of uh, uh, test scores and, and uh, time spent in the, in the education and so on. And the challenge in this, in this uh, uh, Chance Cooper and Rhodes, or abbreviated office as CCR. So the CCR's challenge was to aggregate this multiple different uh, output indicators and input indicators to to uh, single performance metrics. So in the original application, it's very very uh, uh, perhaps descriptive to use the term performance analysis. So we are really interested in the performance of the of the of the schools. But also, also there is a close connection to this notion of productivity that uh, that we discussed in the in the first introductory lectures. So, on this slide, I have indicated this uh, fractional programming formulation that uh, Charles Cooper and Rhodes start with, uh, and uh, uh, this is indeed a weighting problem. So we have have some vector of weights beta for the inputs and another vector of weights gamma for the outputs. And recall that I referred to these gammas already in the, in the discussion of the application. And this gamma is indeed the same, same uh, vector of multiplier weights. So both betas and gammas can be thought of as, as multiplier weights. So to understand this, uh, this mathematical programming problem a little bit better, let's take a, go through it step by step. And, and let's start from the objective function that we are trying to maximize. So on this slide, I have uh, broken down the objective function in the, in the pieces. And uh, there are four different symbols that enter the objective function. I have indicated with the red color the output vector y and uh, also the input factor x. And this subscript i refers here to the to the unit under evaluation. So we are evaluating a uh, unit uh, indicated by i, and we do that by, by solving this kind of uh, uh, mathematical programming problem, where we also have a set of weights. And these weights I have indicated by blue color, and uh, beta indicates the vector of weights uh, corresponding to the input variables x, and gamma is the vector of weights uh, corresponding to the output variables x. So the dimensionality of, uh, of y and gamma is the same and dimensionality of x and b, beta is the same. Okay. And uh, we put all the information related to the outputs to the dominator in the, in the, in the ratio and the denominator has the, the, all the input quantities and their relative weights. So I have, I have used this color code to highlight the fact that, uh, that uh, these inputs and outputs, these X and Y, they are actually observed data. Whereas these uh, weights beta and gamma, they are the variables to be optimized in, the, in this DEA formulation. 
So very often, if you read the DEA papers, it's not really clearly indicated that what do you optimize over. So it's these this, uh, multiplier weights in these formulations, gammas and betas that are the, the unknown variables that need to be solved. Whereas X and Y, they, there's no uncertainty about them. They are just observed data. And uh, I know, want to point this out clearly because very often in in, um, in school mathematics, you indicate the unknown variable by X and potentially by Y, but this is not the notation used in the DEA literature. So here it is this, uh, these uh, betas and gammas are the unknowns that we need to be solving. And uh, remember from this application example, indeed this, uh, these gamma weights and of course also beta weights can be also potentially interesting because those, uh, those are the, the indicate the weights in, in terms of what kind of, uh, kind of uh, in, in terms of which output variables and input variables the unit under evaluated is, is most competitive. Uh, so why do we use this kind of ratio rather than something else? So, so interestingly, this kind of ratio of outputs and inputs, we can also think about it as a, as a measure of productivity. So remember, uh, the general definition of productivity was this kind of uh, uh, aggregate output divided by aggregate input. And in this sense, the DEA formulation does satisfy this kind of, kind of same idea that it's, it's, a, it's a productivity ratio. We can think about this DEA problem indeed as, a, as a finding the weights to maximize the productivity. And uh, a final point in, for those those students who are not comfortable with this uh, vector and matrix notation, uh, we can think about this uh, this vector product as a, as a, as a, as a, a sort of sum product would be the corresponding function in Excel, for example. So what we are actually doing is we multiply each in the in the uh, in the nominator we multiply each output quantity with the corresponding weight, and uh, we sum over all all outputs. So in my notation, we have here capital S is the number of uh, output variables and capital M is the number of uh, input variables. So we multiply each, each uh, output quantity with the corresponding weight and we sum over all, all output variables and same thing we do also for the inputs and do take the ratio of the output and input uh, variables. So what about the constraints then? Uh, two types of constraints are imposed for those, uh, those uh, multiplier weights. Firstly, we require that these uh, multiplier weights must be non-negative. So negative weights are not generally allowed for the, for the, for the yeah, input and output weights. Of course, it's possible to relax that in some cases it may be also helpful to relax, but, uh, but uh, in, the, in the basic model, we require that these weights are non-negative. And uh, another type of constraint is that, uh, that when we apply these uh, multiplier weights, uh, beta and gamma, to other units in the sample, so now I indicate the subscript H, that refers to all other units in the observed sample. So the requirement is that these weights must be such that uh, no other unit in the sample gets uh, efficiency score greater than one. So the maximum possible efficiency is equal to one. So this imposes some constraint to those, uh, those uh, weights gamma and beta. And, uh, and uh, this ensures that the efficiency scores for all units, including the, the uh, evaluated unit itself, must be uh, less than or equal to one. So in that sense, this, uh, the formulation il illustrates that why, why DEA can be seen as this kind of uh, benefit of the doubt weighting. So the objective of this uh, whole mathematical programming formulation is to give uh, as high efficiency score as possible for the, for the unit under evaluation. So we are maximizing this productivity ratio of unit, unit I and only condition is that, uh, that, uh, that uh, when using the same weights, the maximum efficiency has to be 
equal to one. But nothing, nothing else really. So the DEA formulation allows, uh, uh, in some some sense, that the evaluated unit can put put this assign these weights gamma and beta as 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 it wants. So we we can we can find the weights that uh, maximize the performance of the of the evaluated unit. And that also explains why it's possible that for some output variables. Uh, this gamma weight goes to zero because if the if the evaluated unit is not particularly competitive in terms of one of the variables, then it is advantageous to set the, the corresponding gamma weight equal to zero. So then from the practical point of view, solving this kind of uh, fractional programming problem is not really, really uh, convenient from the optimization point of view. So we can actually reformulate the problem, problem a little bit to make it more convenient for the computer to solve it. And uh, I'll, I'll explain it, it shortly and then I'll show you the, the solution that Charles and Cooper have given to this kind of formulation. So consider first this constraint for that, that requires that the, the efficiency score for other units age uh, using those weights gamma and beta must be less than or equal to one. And since these uh, uh, beta weights must be greater than or equal to zero, if we can make sure that at least some of those beta weights are, are strictly positive, uh, we could actually multiply this constraint by, by this uh, some product of x age and 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 beta so this vector product uh, so if you multiply uh this uh, inequality for for units age by by this uh, vector product of x of age and and beta then we get a inequality constraint that this uh, uh, y age multiplied by by gamma is less than or equal to x age multiplied by beta so it's easier to linearize this constraint but what about the objective function? We have also ratio in the objective function. To linearize the objective function, we can also impose, uh, without the loss of generality, we can impose an additional constraint that this uh, vector product of, uh, of uh, uh, xi and beta weights must be equal to one. So we can introduce such kind of additional normalization for those beta weights and and uh, therefore this uh, this uh, denominator of the ratio will go go to e be equal to 1 so we can eliminate it from the objective function and this is called in the in the literature of operational research it's called the uh, chance cooper transformation it goes back to 1962 paper of chance and cooper and in this uh, original data development analysis paper uh, Chance and Cooper actually applied this uh, transformation that they had developed earlier to linearize this uh, this uh, kind of DEA problem where you yeah, where we have this fractional programming problem. So therefore, this formulation um, you can you can see by comparing it to the fractional programming problem, it actually is completely equivalent formulation. But now we have a linear objective function and a system of uh, linear equality and inequality constraints. So therefore we can solve this, uh, this uh, DEA formulation by standard linear programming problem, algorithms and solvers. And this problem needs to be solved uh, separately for each unit under evaluation. And, and this is one of the major results of, uh, of the uh, original CCR article to linearize this, uh, this fractional uh, fractional programming problem using the chance cooper transformation. So, in the theory of linear programming, we also know very well that, uh, that for every, every linear programming problem, there exists an equivalent dual, dual problem. And uh, we can also utilize this duality theory of linear programming problem to gain some additional insight. So notice that with this formulation, we can get these uh, multiplier weights, which uh, I indicated in this uh, empirical application example, this weights gamma for the output variables, 
when we have multiple inputs, we have also weights for those, uh, those inputs, those betas, and we get the efficiency score. But uh, this formulation doesn't give us really the benchmark yet. So there, for that purpose, particularly the dual formulation, which again is completely equivalent way of solving the efficiency score, the dual formulation gives us actually this benchmark. And uh, the dual formulation can be stated like this. So again, the dual formulation is completely equivalent way of solving the efficiency score, but now we formulate the problem slightly differently. So in this problem, we are minimizing some, uh, some uh, multiplier phi. So this Greek uh, letter phi in this, uh, this objective function is just a scalar. And we multiply our evaluated input vector xi with this, uh, this uh, multiplier phi. And our purpose is to uh, minimize this phi. So essentially we are, we are scaling down our input vector xi subject to the constraint that uh, it's greater than or equal to the matrix product of, of the input data matrix X and, and the vector of lambdas. So this vector of lambdas is here the decision variable to be solved. So the sol problem is solved in terms of this lambda weights and multiplier phi, whereas all X and, and, and Y uh, are just observed data. Okay. So lambda is the decision variable and these lambdas are the intensity weights that I reported in, the, in this uh, empirical application. So those are these intensity weights obtained as the optimal solution to this dual problem. So the rationale here is that uh, on the right-hand side of this, this uh, inequality for inputs, we are forming a linear combination of these other, other units in the data set. So that is this uh, uh, matrix X multiplied by, by lambda. And same for the output, we also form a linear combination of outputs as this matrix product of, of Y and lambda. And we have a constraint in this uh, input-oriented formulation that the output vector of the unit under evaluation, this unit I, so output vector YI is less than or equal to, the, to this uh, benchmark computed using these lambda weights. And there is the constraint that these lambda weights must be greater than or equal to zero for all lambda. So lambda is also a vector uh, which has uh, uh, n elements. If you are not so comfortable with the matrix and vector notation, here I have also the same dual formulation written down using the sum. So you can see that the, the, for each input variable, we are solving this kind of, uh, uh, we obtain the, the benchmark as, as, a, as a sum product of this uh, input variables x multiplied by lambda. And we now notice that we do not sum over the different variables, but we sum over the, the units n. So this h is an index that runs from 1 to n. And this uh, constraint is imposed for each input variable separately. And then for each output variable also, we form a benchmark as the linear combination of the outputs of all other, other units. In the basic DEA formulation, when I say other units, this, uh, this uh, index of H actually also includes this uh, unit I under evaluation. So it's possible to also use, the, use its own output and input values in the benchmark. And this is actually what happens when the, when the unit is 100% uh, efficient, then uh, this lambda h is such that its lambda h is equal to zero for all other units and only lambda i, so the lambda corresponding to the unit under evaluation is equal to one. So in, if, in a sense, the efficient units are evaluating against their own performance. And as I illustrated in this empirical application, these lambda weights can be also, also very interesting because they indicate those benchmarks what, which units are efficient and for the inefficient units they are indicated to which efficient units the performance is being compared to. That can be also, also useful to consider, okay, are these uh, uh, efficiency scores meaningful in the sense that does the unit under evaluation get compared to, for example, completely different types of, uh, of, uh, of units? 
are these are these benchmarks meaningful? So I think this uh, dual formulation is also very helpful to illustrate you the difference between input and output orientation. So so far, I have mainly focused on the input oriented formulation that is uh, indicated on the left hand side. For the comparison, I have also on the right hand side, I have also uh, produced the output oriented uh, linear programming formulation. And uh, if we compare these two formulations uh, uh, and consider first the constraints for those inequality constraints. So the constraints for the inputs and outputs are very similar in the input and output oriented uh, formulations. However, the main difference is that in the input oriented formulation, we are multiplying the uh, input vector of the evaluated unit i by this um, coefficient uh, phi, which we are trying to minimize. Whereas there's no any scaling going on in the output variables. The difference in the output orientation is that, uh, that now there's not any scaling of the input, input vector xi, but now we are trying to rescale the output vector yi. And we use this kind of uh, Greek uh, letter theta to indicate this, uh, this output scaling. So theta is a scalar var valued uh, multiplier, and we are trying to scale up uh, all of the output variables by the same factor theta, which we are trying to maximize. The objective function of the output oriented formulation is to maximize theta. And the constraint is that uh, theta times output i should be less than or equal to the, to the benchmark formulated. So in a sense, these uh, lambda weights, they are characterizing the efficient frontier to which we are comparing the performance with. And the output orientation, we keep the inputs xi as given, and we are trying to scale up the output vector yi as much as possible. Whereas in the input orientation, uh, we keep the output vector yi as, as given, and we are trying to uh, scale downwards the input vector xi as, as little as possible, as small as possible. Uh, I indicated in the application lecture that actually this input and output oriented formulations under constant returns to scale as the example here are actually completely equivalent. So if we solve these two, two linear programming problems, then actually the optimal solution is such that the optimal, optimal phi is equal to one divided by optimal theta. And the lambda weights turn out to be exactly the same in both formulations. And this is no longer the case if we add the constraints uh, that, uh, that we have the variable returns to scale specification. So as I have indicated on the bottom part of this slide, uh, variable returns to scale specification is obtained by simply adding an additional constraint that the sum of lambdas must be equal to one. And here I have indicated with this, uh, this uh, vectors. So I, I pre-multiply this uh, lambda vector by, by, by a vector of ones. So if this, this uh, lambda weights are restricted to sum to one, in that case, uh, the input and output oriented formulations can yield different results. So to summarize, as you can see from these DEA formulations, uh, the basic DEA cases, uh, they require two decisions. We need to choose if we have a uh, constant returns to scale or variable returns to scale technology. And then we need to also choose the efficiency metric, whether we use input or output orientation, or perhaps some, some other kind of efficiency metric. But those are the, the two, two specifications in the classical uh, DEA formulations. So in the next video lecture, I will then go a little bit more deeper to the production theory to also shed light on this. What are these kind of uh, uh, production assumptions based on? And uh, we will leave this uh, orientation to uh, a little bit later, but I will also briefly touch upon that.